We are resuming the current series on the vision statement for LRC. The vision, or this vision, is stating the purpose and the reason for why this church here on 2181 East Washington Boulevard, Pasadena, why we exist here. So to remind us what the statement is, and we voted as a church on it at the beginning of the year, uh, it'll be on the screen. To glorify God by making gospel-driven disciples who make disciples. I'll read it again. To glorify God by making gospel-driven disciples who make disciples. Uh, so let's just keep that slide up for now. And just, we just look at this statement. So the first three words, to glorify God, we talked about that uh, at the beginning of the month when we went through Romans chapter 11, the end of Romans 11. Two weeks ago, we looked at making disciples. We discussed the Great Commission from Matthew chapter 28. Right? The mission of the church, of every church really, is to make disciples of all nations. And this leads us, we can go to the next slide now. This is what our statement of faith, the Baptist faith and message says. It says, it is the duty and privilege of every follower of Christ and of every church of the Lord Jesus Christ to endeavor to make disciples of all nations. The new birth of man's spirit by God's Holy Spirit means the birth of love for others. The Lord Jesus Christ has commanded the preaching of the gospel to all nations. It is the duty of every child of God to seek constantly to win the loss to Christ by verbal witness undergirded by a Christian lifestyle and by other methods in harmony with the gospel of Christ. Today, we are going to talk about the last phrase of the vision statement, who make disciples. And we're going to dig into verses 2 through 7 of Titus, of Titus chapter 2. So if you don't mind, let's stand now for the reading of God's word. And then you can sit back down after I read this for us. So the Apostle Paul, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote these words to Titus, his disciple, so it's for him, but also for the churches on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea. So that's the historical context. But these words are just as important and relevant for all of us here and for every church in the world today. So it's back then and today. So Titus 2, 2 through 7. Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. In the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. They are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. In the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. Amen. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now, um, some of you may remember, because this is now four years ago, I preached these verses before I was chosen as the pastor of this church. So I don't know if you remember that. I decided to go through Titus chapter 2, the first few verses, four years ago, and we're going to do it today, because I was asked to answer this question four years ago. Here was the question. How does a church reach millennials? That was the question that was given to me to preach about. Now, I think, and I thought back then, I still think this today, I think the reason for this topic was because the elders and deacons of LRC at that time desired, had a desire for LRC to be a multi-generational church. I think the elders and deacons of LRC wanted LRC to be a spiritual family where younger people would join, and then the generations would intermingle and mix together. If I'm wrong in that thought, then uh, Tubi or Brother Starley, please correct me. All right, that was the desire. 
I think. Okay, I'm getting a nod of approval. Every church wants to reach younger people. Every church wants to feel the energy and the vibrancy that younger people bring. Every church wants to keep going long after the older members pass on. But the truth is that reaching younger generations is easier said than done. Entertainment or trying to be cool really isn't the answer to reach younger people. But never changing and and refusing to be relevant to today's time, that's not the answer either. So you have some people who say, oh, you just got about, you got to do all these like programs and events and, you know, laser, just make it cool and entertaining and they will, they will come. Okay? Make it like a Taylor Swift concert, I guess. But then other people say, no, we will never change. This church will always do this. We will, all, we will, we will always sing just hymns. If you don't sing a hymn, oh, this bad. So... No, we're never going to change, right? Everyone has to wear a suit and tie, and the ladies must wear dresses. I've heard people say that. Consider these words that are written by a professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in North Carolina. He writes this on the screen. Many churches consist of one primary generation, and that's not the healthiest church. At the same time, though, growing an intentionally multi-generational church is not easy. Now, if you walked in through the welcome table, the foyer, you might have seen that I actually printed a few copies of this article that I just quoted from. They're on the table over there, so you might want to pick up a copy and read the whole article for yourself, but I'm just going to uh, briefly kind of summarize, because in this article, he gives five reasons on why it is difficult to have a multi-generational church. Everybody wants it. But he gives five reasons why it's hard. I'll just share the first three. Number one, generational differences are honest and real. Number two, congregations gravitate toward people most like them. Number three, intentionality requires action that can make everybody uncomfortable. And then on the screen, he also writes this. We tend to hang out with and reach out to people who are at the same stage of life as we are. Moving beyond our own generation requires work. Becoming multi-generational sometimes means that we joyfully worship through music we don't like, listen to stories that seem irrelevant, and welcome input from people who just don't seem to get it. Everybody chooses to give up a little to gain much. Now, in Paul's letter to his disciple Titus, Titus is encouraged to set up healthy churches. So in Titus chapter 1, the qualifications for elders are listed. And in the first verse of Titus 2, we read this command from Paul. So let's look in our Bibles, Titus 2, 1. But you are to proclaim things consistent with sound teaching. So Titus is told to preach and teach what's good and healthy. Titus is told to make disciples and follow the Great Commission. Because making disciples includes teaching others to obey and observe all that Jesus commanded. And the commands from Christ are found in the Bible. And the commands that come, also come, from the Holy Spirit through the words of the Apostle Paul that are written in the New Testament. So what is Paul emphasizing to Titus to the churches on the Mediterranean island of Crete, and to every gospel church today, including LRC, what is the summary, the emphasis of these verses in Titus 2? Well, I think it's this. Older believers should disciple younger believers. Older believers should disciple younger believers. In verses 2 to 7, we see a pattern, I think. The pattern is this, older brothers should disciple younger brothers, older sisters should disciple younger sisters, and if we think about it, these are the four age and gender groups in every church, right? Two genders, male and female, and basically two age groups, older and younger. 
So that equals two plus two equals four. So the biblical pattern ought to be that older men are discipling younger men and boys, while at the same time older women are discipling younger women and girls. This discipling pattern is the key for a local church to be truly multi-generational in a family of God. All right, but what does it mean to disciple? Because we can take incorrect steps as a church if we don't know what it, that word means, discipling. Well, to disciple is to influence. Discipling is when one Christian influences another Christian to love, to know, to obey, to follow, to worship, and to enjoy Jesus Christ more and more. Discipling is teaching and telling the gospel to a fellow Christian. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 says what? To make disciples. And in the local church context here in Titus chapter 2, older believers should disciple younger believers. Now, I have a question. How do we determine who is older and who is younger? Is someone older when he or she gets their first little gray hair or when they start losing their hair? Is it when a person starts collecting Social Security or starts taking it out from their pension or 401k? That's when someone is older? Or is it when a person becomes a parent or an auntie or an uncle? So that's when you are older. For example, I am turning 41 this year. So I'm 40, I'm turning 41. And you're thinking, what? So I'm turning 41. I'm thinking, that's, yeah, what? I'm 41? No. Okay. To a teenager today. So like Adeline or Aisa, you know what they see me as? Old. I'm an old man. Even though I don't think I am, but to, to them, I'm old. And for sure, to teenagers today, if a person does not use TikTok or doesn't know what TikTok is, that person's automatically considered, oh, well, you're an older person. So I guess that's me, because I just have Instagram and Facebook. But to our more experienced members of our church, I am still a what? A younger man. Even though on one level, right, you've heard the term over the hill, because I'm 40, I'm, I am over the hill. Lord willing, I still have some decades to go in my life. I think, I hope. Well, according to most Bible scholars, older men and older women were those who were above the age of, anyone want to take a guess? 65, 30, well, 30, that's okay. Anyone else want to take a guess? How, what is considered older from the Bible? 70, okay. 120. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, we're all young then. The answer, according to most Bible scholars, is in the New Testament is 50. 50 is kind of the, the general line. So generally speaking, okay, generally speaking, if someone is above the age of 50, that person is considered an older believer. If you have not yet reached the age of 50, you're considered a younger believer. Here's one example from 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 5, 9. No widow is to be enrolled on the list for support unless she is at least 60 years old. The specific number in the Bible. And then later in verse 11 of 1 Timothy 5, younger widows are mentioned. So it seems 50 or 60 is the, the dividing line. Okay, anyone feel weird about their age now? Here's an Old Testament call for the older to disciple the younger. So Psalm 78, the first seven verses say this. My people, hear my instruction. Listen to the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past. Things we have heard and known that our ancestors have passed down, or you could say discipled to us. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell or disciple a future generation the praiseworthy acts of the Lord, his might, and the wondrous works he has performed. 
He established a testimony in Jacob and set up a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children so that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know. They were to rise and tell their children so that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works, but keep his commands. <clears throat> now, I, I, I think I need to say this before we make the mistake, because we could make this mistake, of thinking that only people over the age of 50 should disciple. Some people might think that, okay, only the older people should do that. Well, no, the reality is that for most everyone, there is someone older than you, and there's someone younger than you. So unless you are the age of the little boys back in the cry room right now, there is always somebody younger than you. So teenagers, college students, young parents are not excused from Titus chapter 2 and discipling someone younger than them. Discipling someone younger is for every generation. So boomers, Gen Xers should disciple. Millennials, like me, Gen Zers, like our teenagers, should disciple. Older believers should disciple younger believers. Now, what does this discipling between the generations look like? Well, how should older to younger discipling happen? Well, from our verses, here's the first way. Be examples worthy of respect. So let's go back to verse 2. It says this, Older men are to be self-controlled, worthy of respect, sensible and sound in faith, love and endurance. Verse 3, in the same way, older women are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to excessive drinking. And then if we jump down to verse 7, the second sentence in verse 7 says this, Make yourself an example of good works with integrity and dignity in your teaching. So what kind of life from older men and women are examples that are worthy of respect? Well, it says here in, the, in Titus 2, self-controlled, wise, honest, dignified behavior. Mature faith and love that does not verbally assassinate another person's character. And if we think about it, this list of character qualities here in Titus 2 in verses 2, 3, and 7, are similar to where else in the Bible? Well, they are pretty much the same as last week's verses, 1 Timothy 3 on elders and deacons, and they're also similar to verses 6, 7, and 8 in Titus chapter 1. It's the importance of having godly character that serves as worthy examples for a local church. During my second year, when I was living in Maryland on the East Coast, there was a lady who began to attend our church's Sunday morning worship service. So we didn't know who she was. She had moved actually from Texas to Maryland, like me, and she started attending our church. And this lady started participating in the community groups that we had. She attended the, prayer, the Saturday morning prayer gatherings that we had. And as an older woman, it seems she would be a good role model for the younger ladies of our church. This lady even mentioned that she wanted to meet with younger church females. So all good, right? Well, when we asked this lady if she wanted to join the church as a member, she refused. I later found out this is months later, that she was bad-mouthing me and our church leadership behind our backs, just telling all this stuff to the members of our church. She apparently was sending emails and fire off text messages to members detailing why our church was a failure. And she had the solution for all of our problems. Before she stopped attending our church, because eventually she stopped going to our church, this lady met with the church staff while I was out of town. I was actually, I think, in Texas at that time, and she demanded a meeting with the staff, and I heard later that that meeting went really poorly. 
And this lady's final act was to blast the leaders of the church in a long, long email. So I remember I read this long email once, and then I hit delete. That was fun stuff. Now, dear older sisters and brothers, the church needs your godly examples of character. We need your examples of good works to learn from. We do. If we as a local church family do not see your good examples of faith, hope, love, and endurance, then the younger sisters and brothers, we will suffer. They will not mature in Christ as much as they can because we need your amazing and beautiful and good examples in Jesus' name. Amen. Since I have been a member of LRC, so it's almost four years now, I sometimes have asked about our church before Katie and I joined because there's a long history before us. And more than one person has actually mentioned to me some good examples that they have seen from older brothers and sisters. So some people have mentioned people like Brother Armando and Brother Sarley and Sister Norma, among others, for their faithfulness. And so when I hear that, you know what I say, what I think? Praise Jesus for them. Praise Jesus. And praise Jesus for all of our older brothers and sisters, the older men and women of LRC. Because without you all, brothers and sisters, we would be as a church in deep, deep trouble without your experience, your wisdom, and your faith. Can I get an amen? Here's a word from a Southern Baptist pastor who lives in Washington, D.C. He's in his 60s. He writes this, We communicate not merely with our words, but by our whole lives. And what happens in the discipling relationship requires more than classroom teaching. It requires the kind of instruction that occurs through an apprenticeship at a job or with a personal trainer or coach. An apprentice learns by listening and watching and participating little by little with more responsibility being earned over time. Older believers should disciple younger believers by being examples worthy of respect. Second, Teach and encourage what's good. So if we go to verse 3, the second sentence says this. They, in reference to older women, are to teach what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands and to love their children, to be self-controlled, pure, workers at home, kind, and in submission to their husbands so that God's word will not be slandered. Verse 6, in the same way, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. So not only are older believers called to be respectable examples, older men and women should teach what is good. They should encourage younger believers to live with self-control. So this means that older men in the church should meet with younger men. Older brothers should mentor and teach and encourage younger brothers. And what's the good that older males should teach younger males in the church? Well, everything that's listed in verse 2 here. And also the character list for elders that we see in 1 Timothy 3 and 1 Peter 5. There's also the responsibility for husbands in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3. There's also teaching life skills such as setting a budget, applying for a job, Basically, we want younger guys to learn what it means to grow as what? As a man of God. Here are a few more words from the pastor I quoted earlier. He writes this, It's fine to talk about football or the kids' school, but talk about Sunday's sermon as well. Ask your friends what God has been teaching you about himself. Community groups can also be useful for for facilitating these kinds of relationships. But as we also see in verses 3 to 5, older women in the church should meet with the younger woman. Older sisters should mentor and teach and encourage younger sisters. And what's the good that older ladies should teach younger ladies in the church? Well, everything that's listed here in verse 3. There's also the character list for deacons 
in 1 Timothy 3. There's also the Proverbs 31 woman in Proverbs 31. There's also the responsibility for wives that we see in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3. There's also teaching life skills, such as maybe what does it look like to buy a car? Or how do you write a resume? So many other life skills that people need to learn. Basically, we want younger gals to learn what it means to grow as a woman of God. Here's a word from a pastor's wife who lives in the Middle East. She writes this, these verses aren't just about older women befriending younger women in the church. They're not primarily about teaching young women how to cook healthy meals or discipline an unruly child, although those things can be included. Titus 2, 3 to 5 is about sharing our lives with one another, older women spending time with younger women, intentionally discipling them to live for God's glory. Now, dear aunties and uncles, I'll also say it's dear ates and cuyas, you all have a wealth of wisdom and knowledge and experience to share with younger people. God has graciously given you gifts to use in discipling younger believers. You can, you can, you can teach and encourage what is good in Jesus' name. So please invest in the younger generations. Please help strengthen this church for the future. Please serve as spiritual parents and grandparents for our church family. You all are a blessing that we desperately need in LRC. Amen. I think it was a couple of years ago when a few church couples met for a few months, once a month. If I remember correctly, the Woos, the Rainers, both Molina couples, the Cantados, and the Lees, and I, there might have been other couples as well, joined in a monthly Zoom call. And we did this for a few months. And, and what was fun and interesting was during these monthly Zoom call meetings, the couples with young babies or with no babies yet, like I think that was me and Katie, we just wanted to hear and learn from the couples with older kids. So we just kept asking the older Molinas and the Rainers and the Cantados, how do you do it? How do you do it as parents? And they would share. And the rest of us would just be like listening. Okay, okay, okay. So here's the thing. In April, we are having a Wednesday Bible study series on marriage. Because that has been a request. Let's talk about marriage. So we're going to go through a book on marriage, on a gospel-centered marriage, because I think all of us want to grow as a godly spouse or a godly parent. And so I think this is a wonderful opportunity for our entire church to participate together and talk about what does it mean to have gospel-centered marriages. And I know for, I just speak for me and Katie, we look forward to learning from all of you. Older believers disciple younger believers by teaching and encouraging what is good. But I also want to say this now. Younger believers can disciple older believers too. So back to the pastor I quoted earlier, he writes this. Normally, you'll disciple someone younger than yourself. Having said that, Scripture is full of exceptional examples of the younger teaching the older, and surely as we advance in age, we also want to advance in the humility of learning from those our own age and even those younger than us. Otherwise, we'll have no teachers left. So if I'm a younger believer, if I am under the age of 50, I can disciple an older believer by being a good example. Here's an encouragement that Paul gave to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. Don't let anyone despise your youth, but set in what? An example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And if I'm a younger believer, if I'm not yet 50, I can disciple an older believer by also encouraging them. Paul also says this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5. 
Don't rebuke an older man, but exhort or encourage him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. So LRC family and friends, if I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, I can, I should disciple other believers. We all need mentors. We all should have mentees, people we are mentoring. We all need peers. We should make disciples. We should be disciples who make disciples. We should make disciples who then go make disciples. Okay, now I want to get practical and share two kind of practical suggestions and opportunities, and then I want to give a homework challenge. I'm going to give homework today to all of us, okay, here and watching. So this is not going to be on the screen, so just listen carefully, or you can take notes. Okay, here is suggestion opportunity number one. Maximize community groups. Maximize community groups. Hebrews 10 says this, And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So discipling each other, it will never work if we do not spend time with one another. If a husband and a wife do not go and date, don't don't go on dates after their wedding day, their marriage will not be as healthy as it can be for the glory of God, correct? In the same way, if our only interaction with fellow other believers is on Sunday mornings, and I never, ever, ever spend time with fellow Christians in a smaller group setting outside of the Sunday morning worship service, then this local church, I guarantee you, we will not be as healthy as we can be. We cannot neglect gathering together. We are called, as Hebrews 10 says, to provoke love and good works for one another. We can encourage each other only if we intentionally meet with each other. So our usual rhythm for the community groups has been meeting one Sunday a month. And that's good because we should at least meet monthly. But here's a challenge I think we can pursue. Try it out this year. 2024. In addition to meeting one Sunday per month, I think it would be wonderful if our community groups met one other day of the month. So one Sunday plus one other day in the month equals twice a month for the glory of God. So for example, this doesn't have to be hard. This could mean the other non-Sunday just meeting together. This could be the group just meeting for dinner. Just have dinner together on a Friday evening. Just meet somewhere for dinner, at a restaurant, at someone's place. Or this could mean the men go to a Dodgers game this summer. Right? Let's watch Yamamoto pitch and Shohei hit. Okay? We can do that. Or this could be that the ladies gather together and go out to Huntington Library or Lockmore or wherever else they want to go to. And the husbands will take care of the kids. Or it could be that the entire community group can just go together to the beach or to the park and just spend time. Right? You don't have to do a Bible study, just spend time, be with each other. The possibilities are endless to fellowship, hang out, and disciple each other, but it requires us to be intentional. It requires us to initiate. And you know what? I think these are wonderful opportunities then to invite non-Christians to join us. That's a non-threatening environment. Here's a second opportunity. Invite with hospitality. Invite with hospitality. 1 Peter 4 says this, Above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. All right, here is my homework. Okay, there's no grade. Okay, we're not going to... The elders indeed, we're not going to grade pass fail. This is just personal homework between you and Jesus. If I am older than 50, invite someone younger than 50 for a meal or for coffee. Invite someone one time in February and invite another person one time in March. Or invite a younger couple together. 
if I don't feel comfortable inviting a younger person to my home, then invite that person or that couple to Chick-fil-A or Starbucks or somewhere else. Invite, be hospitable, get to know younger believers. Maybe if you don't have lunch plans today, you can invite someone. But this is not just for our older sisters and brothers. If I'm younger than the age of 50, so this is the homework for those of us who are younger, invite someone older than 50 for a meal or for coffee. Invite someone one time in February. Invite another person one time, another person one time in March, or invite an older couple together. If I don't feel comfortable inviting an older person to my home, then invite that person or that couple to Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, or somewhere else. Invite, be hospitable, get to know older believers. And if I don't have lunch plans today, maybe I can invite someone. So whether we are drinking frappuccinos or tea at Starbucks, or whether we are eating Christian nuggets at Chick-fil-A, or whether we are eating yummy in the tummy food at H Mart, we can all invite each other. And if we, I think, if we as a church pursue this goal of invitation and hospitality, we will all get to know one another better. And we will open up opportunities for mutual discipling. So for me personally, I can remember times in the past in our church when I have eaten meals with some of our older sisters and brothers in our church. And especially when Katie was out of town doing her clinical rotations, I was so happy that I was not home alone for a meal in the parsonage, and sometimes some of the older couples would invite me. So I remember the Bayans invited me, the Reyes invited, the Fajardos. I was like, thank you, yay, I get to eat with somebody, right? Not just by myself and watch YouTube. So you know what? We can all do this together. We can. We can. All right, but why should we do this? Why? Why should we care? Well, quickly, here's one reason. Actually, there's two. Number one, for God's word. The end of verse 5 says this, so that God's word will not be slandered. If we fail as a church to disciple each other, then we are saying that God's word is worthless. We are showing that the Bible is a bunch of religious junk. If we do not pursue the goal of multi-generational discipling, then we will discredit God's word, and we will, as it says here, slander it. And who would then want to believe that God's word is true? So sisters and brothers, our lives, each one of us, is a testimony that God's word is real, that the Bible is true, and that we are disciples of Christ. John 13, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One more reason why we should do this. It's for the gospel. Now, in our Bibles... If you want to look with me, in verses 11 to 14, we read this. <clears throat> Titus 2, 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, instructing us to deny godlessness and worldly lusts, and to live in a sensible, righteous, and godly way in the present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession eager to do good works. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ has appeared, correct? He came to bring grace. He came to bring salvation for sinners like us. He came to instruct and teach us what is good. He came to be our perfect example. Jesus came to disciple people like us by giving his life to redeem sinners. That's how he did it. So every time you and I, we fail to disciple, every time we sin as poor examples, unworthy of respect, every time we sin by teaching what is not good, and every time we encourage evil, Jesus paid it all on the cross, past, present, and future. 
the grace of God has appeared. If you are not a Christian this morning, here or watching, please consider the gospel for yourself. This is the most important message in the world. Please think about, this is the greatest good news you will ever hear in this world for the whole wide world. And the call of the gospel, the good news, if you are not a Christian today, is to admit that you are a sinner in need of saving, in need of help. Believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, God, and Savior. Confess faith. Trust in him. You can be saved by grace through faith today. And for those of us who do admit and believe and confess the ABCs, let us be disciples who make disciples. Let's trust and obey because there is no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Let's be good examples to one another. Let us teach one another what is good. But if we are wondering if our church can really do this, if we can really grow in discipling across the generations, I want to end by sharing a true story that I hope can encourage all of us today. In April 2019, there was a woman named Eleanor Baker who went to a barbecue restaurant in Oxford, Alabama. This lady, Ms. Eleanor, was an 80-year-old widow, and she was eating alone in the restaurant. Why did she go to this restaurant? Well, it was the day before her 60th wedding anniversary. and She went to the restaurant alone. After Ms. Eleanor started eating dinner by herself, three younger men entered the restaurant to eat dinner. One of the men saw this older lady, Ms. Eleanor, eating alone, so he went up to her and he asked if he could join her and sit with her and eat with her. She said, yes, and they started talking. He introduced himself, and when the younger man found out about her anniversary, that she was a widow and she lived alone with her dog, all of her kids and grandkids lived out of state, he then invited Ms. Eleanor to sit at his table with his friends. She gratefully said yes to their invitation. She accepted their hospitality. These three younger gentlemen, in their 20s, encouraged and loved an older lady in her 80s. Even more, they're in Alabama. These younger men were African American, and Ms. Eleanor was white. When the news media interviewed the young men, one of them said the following. He said this, it won't be on the screen. I want to change the world somehow, and I don't know how. Because I'm not rich, I'm not famous, I'm not very smart either, so I can't be the president, but I already feel like we are her grandkids. And when the media interviewed Ms. Eleanor about this, them now forming this friendship, what did she say? I think it was a God thing. I think God sent me there as an example that people care about people and how important it is. Now, this sweet sister, Ms. Eleanor, passed away the following year in November 2020. But I am certain, I'm pretty sure, she made an impact on these younger men in this year and a half that she got to know them. God gave her opportunities to share her life with them before she went home to be with Jesus. So if meeting someone in a barbecue restaurant was not random for these people, then it is not a coincidence that we are all here together and you are watching in online today in this church. There is a reason, there is a purpose. We are here together in one church family, Living Rock Church. It is not a coincidence. It is not random. So let's disciple each other. 
Let's encourage each other. Let's pursue the joy of being a church throughout all the generations who make disciples and make disciples and make disciples. Romans chapter 12, verses 10 and 13. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Share with the saints and their needs. Pursue hospitality. Amen. Now we're going to do this because we do this once a month. We're going to have a time of sharing and praying together. So I want to ask if we can partner up with someone that we do not live with, so we don't share the same roof. Okay, sit with someone else, and let's just share these questions, share prayer requests, and pray together. Can we do that? Let's pray. Father, may it be that no matter what happens in our life, the blessings that happen or when we feel like we're in a storm, Wherever we may be, however we may be feeling, may we be reminded that in Christ alone our hope is found. He is the rock on which we can and should stand. Father, as we go forward this week, as we end January and begin February, guide us as whether we are in school, at work, at home, wherever we may be, that we may grow as disciples who yearn, who desire to make disciples of all nations, that we would desire to be involved and intentional with one another here in the church and also with many others outside of the church that we may invite them and welcome them to this church family. Guide us and bless us as we go forward this week. Now hear this reading from God's word. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. And every disciple of Jesus says, Amen.